Hello, science enthusiasts. Welcome to Science Chat with Dr. Liz Murray and myself, your host, Jason Zakowski. I'm the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker. My co host is. Uh, Chris Sikowski, <laughs> Mummy Fabe, also known as um, Co host Extraordinaire. Co host Extraordinaire. We're going to have a little interview with our amazing guest, Dr. Liz Murray. Um, after we ask a few questions, we'll open up the floor to our audience. Thank you, everybody, for showing up today to listen to some science. And uh, welcome, Dr. Liz Murray. Dr. Murray, how's it going? It's going good. I'm here in lovely Calgary, Alberta. So thank you to everybody for tuning in to listen to me today. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We chatted on the Science Podcast and I loved our talk. Um, I do have to ask, how is the new to you bike treating you? I'm, oh. a, I'm a little jealous. <laughs> uh, it's actually pretty good. I have to admit, though, I have a commuter bike that I've had for a number of years. I love that bike. Okay. But this new to me bike is a close second. So what 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 um what we talked about on the podcast and and what's interesting is parts of Calgary, um Calgary is the big city just south of where we live. It, it's quite bike friendly and and along the river valley there. So we had chatted that's something you enjoy to do. And I I saw your bike and I was like, you know, I really miss biking, um to work because uh, I live in the country and I can't do that anymore. Yeah, you know it, it's great uh, to do that first thing in the morning because it, it gives you that. Sp- Space and time to just plan your day and think about what you want to do. And as a scientist, you really need to ponder some results sometimes. And so it just gives you that great space. And of course, the scenery is beautiful along the river. You always run into interesting people and all the other commuters that you get to recognize. So it's always a great way to start the day. Well, and you come around the corner. um, I'm thinking of like the bend and then the Rockies are there just in the morning. (laughs) Yeah, I go the other direction. I go oh, okay. from the northwest into downtown, but the sun rises over downtown and then you get reflections in the river and it's incredibly beautiful to just cycle into that. Nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> we get nice sunsets out here and sunrises. Um, I just have to do it by foot because there's no bike trails in rural Alberta. Yeah. On a farm. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we're incredibly lucky here in Calgary. There's hundreds of kilometers of bike paths, mm-hmm. so it's it uh, is very bike friendly. I know, I know. It's uh, for for Comic Con, we've stayed in Airbnbs downtown, and I've just marveled at uh, the infrastructure. Um, and and they they've started those scooters, those electric scooters. Hey, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, oh, I'm I'm uh, not brave enough yet to try one because I'm a bit of a speed demon on my bike. So I think <laughs> if I went on a scooter, I would hurt myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure some people in the audience are puzzled when we say scooter, but they're like um, rideshare scooters. You pay into a monthly subscription fee, I believe. And you just walk yeah. up and you can hop on these scooters that are everywhere and just zip around uh, downtown Calgary. They yeah. have them in Red Deer too, actually. They're very popular. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a version of bike share only it's scooters and it's incredibly popular here. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to watch people because you get people in their suits and their dresses and <laughs> Yeah, they're on a scooter so, going into downtown in their high heels. And yeah, it's, actually, it's funny because I do I do see people riding their bikes into downtown that way. I passed this lady. She was in uh, she was a fairly young lady, and she was on one of those traditional upright bikes that you have to step through on. Mm. And uh, she had the most fabulous hair and glasses and high <laughs> heels and a dress high on. Heels. And I'm like, oh, it was, a, and that's what bike protected bike lanes allow you to do right Mm. you can just you feel safe you don't feel like you have to have a helmet on all the time and you know you just it it just has made cycling that much more doable for a larger portion of the population Mm -hmm. yeah that's so i love that 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 fills me with hope uh (laughs) even for (laughs) even for our very um how would you say it? Uh, oil and gas uh, province, right? That they're, they're, we're, there's, yes. they're, we are moving towards some things that are a little bit more um, more green, which is awesome. Now, I I, yeah. I introduced you as I introduced you as Doctor Liz Murray. Uh, what is your training? What do you What do you have a doctorate in? Could you tell us about that? <laughs> mm, absolutely nothing to do with what I do for a job. Oh. Okay. How's that? I, I'm <laughs> no, sure, I'm sure I can we, say that. I do. It's a great story. I, 
It is. I, I actually have an undergraduate degree in biology from Lakehead University, which is in Thunder Bay, which is um, uh, just on Lake Superior there for people that may not be familiar with that part of Canada. And I knew when I was doing an undergrad in biology that I, I wanted to do something in the field of medicine, but I didn't necessarily think being a physician was the greatest fit for me. So I uh, checked out some labs at Queen's University in Kingston, which is near Toronto, if you're not familiar with that area. And I ended up with the pathology department there where I did a human genetics research in a bleeding disorder called von Willebrand's disease. And I actually did my master's and PhD in human genetics. And um, one of the exciting things I got to do as a scientist, as a graduate student is us and a group in Boston were the first two groups in the world to find the genetic mutation that caused a particular type of von Willebrand's disease, which was a fascinating gain of function disorder where um, a protein in your blood that binds to platelets and stops you from bleeding uh, gets hyperactive and causes its own host of problems. So that was a fascinating project that I did there. And then from, from uh, finishing my PhD at Queen's University, I headed out to the University of Calgary where I did two postdoctoral fellowships in cancer biology, looking at uh, signal transduction. So how cells um, communicate with each other and get signals from their environment, which tells them what to do. So that was uh, another fascinating field. And then as I moved into my working life, I actually ended up uh, at a biotech company in Calgary called Symbiosis Genetics, which was a really cutting edge, cool place to work because we actually took the genes from uh, a select few human proteins and we express them in plants and then we isolated those human proteins and um, purified them as pharmaceuticals. So we actually made human insulin in plants and did clinical trials on that in people. So that was a super cool job. Right. And so so while I was can, there, I just, can I just ask a question there? Yeah. Like why that's so profound is like insulin traditionally when they first discovered it, like came from, and like they'd smash up animal stuff, right? Like it was, yeah. it was really and, hard to get, right? And then now, yeah, and, and go ahead, you, you you know more than me, but the reason why you did it yeah. in plants is so cool because... Um, normally, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, normally you'd express this gene in either a mammalian cell or an insect cell or something like that. But when you can express it in plants and target it to oil seeds, and then you can use the biology and the chemistry of the little oil storage vacuoles in the oil seed as a purification mechanism because the the insulin we actually targeted it to express on the half unit membrane that was around these uh, little oil storage va vacuoles so you'd wow. have this little ball of oil and this little coating of protein and hanging off of it would be your insulin and you would engineer a, an enzyme site in there so you could actually cleave it off wow. but before you cleaved, <laughs> but before you cleaved it off you could actually use the oil in the little oil vacuole to float it away from all the other proteins because the most expensive part of purifying proteins is getting rid of everything you don't want and so this was a really uh, large scale cheap way to purify large amounts of protein and it it was a, a way that um, reduced the cost of insulin production and increased the volume of insulin production so that uh, if it had ever gone to market, and there are various reasons why it didn't get there, but it, it, would be, um, it would be accessible to those countries that weren't as wealthy as mm. the North American and European countries because um, it was cheaper to make it that way. Mm. Um, can, I, can I ask just a couple questions before we get to what you do now? Um, yeah. Yeah. So Von Willebrand's disease, you, you mentioned that, that you did that in your master's slash uh, PhD, I believe. You, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that you said that was a bleeding disorder. Um, th yes. Is that like hemophilia? Like you can't stop. The it bleeding? is. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So the difference between von Willebrand's disease or von Willebrand factor and um, the factor eight and factor nine proteins that are involved in hemophilia A and hemophilia B yep. is that um, – Von Willebrand factor actually is the molecule that sticks platelets, the little um, vessel or the little cells in your bloodstream. It actually takes the platelets and it sticks it to the exposed uh, underside of your vessel. So when you have damage to the vessel, it exposes a subendothelium and the von Willebrand factor 
uh, bridges the little platelets to uh, the hole. And it, so it's basically uh, allows it to plug up. When you look at hemophilia and hemophilia A and hemophilia B, those proteins actually are part of the coagulation cascade. And it's what causes the clot that holds those little platelets over the hole. So von Willebrand factor facilitates the platelets sticking to the hole, and then the other proteins in the coagulation cascade are basically the glue that holds it all there. Hmm. So it's like the first layer duct tape versus like the yeah the the big pile on, which is the clotting factor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just, you know, what's really interesting is um, like, cause I'm, I'm always doing uh, like a little bit of research for the podcast. Cause I break a, down a science story. And the one last week I didn't go with was about hemophilia and they put some, I'd have to, again, like I just breeze through it, but um, it's not related to von Bullebrand's disease, but I believe they put some kind of like, uh, like that, that coagul the, the protein that was missing in hemophilia in some virus um, and then gave it to people with hemophilia and it really helped their disorder. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was really cool that they're still working on this kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it can be quite a devastating disease mm -hmm. and, uh, can be quite a challenge at times because it, I mean, the coagulation cascade is so complicated. So it's, it's, um, yeah, fascinating field. Of course, human genetics is a fascinating field. I know you, yeah, you mentioned what you did to get the insulin to grow in plants and you're like, and you just float it away as if it was nothing, but it's incredibly complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, such a cool technology, that one. Yeah. So you, you went from human genetics and you worked with this company growing insulin in plants, quote unquote, growing insulin yeah. in plants. Um, what, what did you transition to now? Where, where are you at now? So, I mean, we suffered the fate of a lot of small biotech companies in that uh, we were working in a really expensive field, which is injectable drugs. And it uh, takes an incredible amount of money to fund that kind of research. Mm -hmm. And we were hoping to get it far enough where it got bought um, and we were taken over by somebody, but we ran out of money before then. So mm -hmm. what do you do when you run out of money and your job disappears? You think, hmm, what transferable skills do I have? And I uh, did the old networking thing and <laughs> got introduced to a company that uh, needed a scientific writer and editor. And uh, I don't know how many of your listeners are, are graduate students or postdocs that are going to begin job hunting. But one of the things that gets your foot in the door is to have some other specialty skills that might make you more attractive than somebody has got that's got the same education and experience as you. And one of the things that I was always involved in uh, in my jobs, and it was um, developing safety programs, whether it's biohazard safety or radiation safety or whatever. And this particular oil and uh, environmental company that does mostly oil and gas related client work um, needed a, a safety person that was in the office, as well as a scientific writer and editor. And so I had all those skills and agreeing to run their safety program is what got me the offer. They, uh, this job actually didn't exist when I went and talked to them. They, I managed to sell them on what I could do for them because they're like, well, you have this PhD in human genetics. What do you want to come and work for an environmental company for? We're never, you know, you've got, you have way more education than what we normally hire. And are you going to be challenged enough being here? And I said, well, you know, you guys, um, this is what I can do for you. I can bring a certain level of quality control to your program and I can facilitate taking scientific ideas and results and making them very simple to understand and mm -hmm. convey your message. And, and they said, okay. <laughs> and so I, that's what I was hired for. But then we had a collaborator uh, at the university of Waterloo, Dr. Bruce Greenberg, and he had developed a phytoremediation system. So that's a combination of bacteria and plants that, um, are used to grow plants in challenging conditions. And he had developed the technology to uh, remediate hydrocarbons and salts in soil. And he was our scientific collaborator and then he retired. And so I said to the owner of our company, well, everything that um, Dr. Greenberg is able to do, I have those skills. So why don't we build a lab in house and I can take over running the R&D portion of this program? Because it was it's a commercial program. We were the the um, environmental company that was able to facilitate commercialization of this program and 
use it on large scale oh. um, contaminated sites in the province because we worked in environmental uh, services in the oil and gas industry. So we know how to go onto an oil and gas site. And I think you had mentioned before your background was in oil and gas. You can't just go walk on an oil site, oil and gas site, even if it's abandoned and there's no infrastructure there. There are certain safety training uh, things that you have to go through. And yes. so we knew how to navigate the whole field of regulations and clients and all of that. And so um, we were already doing the commercial side. And then when I said, let's take over the R&D side, we built a lab and a plant growth facility in our Calgary office. And we hired a full-time scientist, Mike, that works with me. And then uh, we took over the R&D program. So I just want to give a shout out here, though, because I'm part of a team. It's not just me. Mm -hmm. I have a, a full-time scientist that does the lab work. And then I work with uh, teams, uh, field specialists who really can take our ideas and go to the field and tell the big heavy yellow equipment what to do and how thick to make things and how to rip it, how to seed it, how to fertilize it. Mm -hmm. You know, they can go to a site that's been planted and look at something and say, it's missing this, or this has been really good, or this plant's not working well here. I think we need to try something different. And so I'm the I call myself the science nerd. Those guys are really the field experts and they're the, the ones that really get this technology working on the ground. Hmm. If you're just joining us, this is uh, science chat with um, Dr. Liz Murray. Uh, what would your class, what would you call yourself? A phytoremediation scientist, geneticist slash science nerd? Like <laughs> what, would your, what would your title be doc? Uh, I am science nerd, science <laughs> number nerd. one, and uh, <laughs> but my title, my actual title, is senior scientist. Senior scientist, and okay. I, uh, yeah, and I am the R and D director for the phytoremediation program. Gotcha. Now you mentioned having um, an extra skill makes you more, you know, it makes you more uh, what would, marketable. <laughs> so yes. my my extra skills of like juggling maybe that isn't so great compared <laughs> to having a PhD is that what you're saying um <laughs> well I, I'll give you I'll give you a good example when we were at symbiosis genetics we would hire uh, a whole group of summer students and we got applications from all over Canada for these positions because mm. what a cool job right you get to come to a company like that get to genetically modify plants to produce a human drug so super cool and you'd get like 300 applications for like five jobs and you're going through them and you're trying to figure out who's good. And, and, and we hired one summer student one year because he had quite a bit of experience of running golf tournaments and he was equal uh, to a lot of the other students we we're looking at as far as where he was in his education and how, you know, the classes he'd taken and all that. But he also had experience running golf tournaments. We're like, okay, if we bring this guy on board, he can run our golf tournament as well because <laughs> we don't want to do it anymore. So oh my he has that because running a golf tournament yeah. for a hundred or 150 people, that's like planning a wedding. Like that's, that's a, a skill, right? Yeah. And so he knew how to do all of that communication, get prizes, set up teams, you know, facilitate the day, that kind of thing, which is a really great transferable skill to have. And that got him in the door. And he was really great at science, too, because he, he had to have the right science background and, you know, be equal with everybody else as far as that goes. But that one extra special skill, I'm like, <laughs> yes, don't have to run the golf tournament this year. I love it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 um yeah well and also people want to come to calgary it's it's a gorgeous city and it's so close to the rockies like um you know it's it's kind of like a, a to a destination like vancouver right like it's just a beautiful place to be yeah yeah um, it is and then i think just for co context like uh if you're not from alberta if you're listening and you're not even like not canadian even you may not understand alberta um is the oil and gas producing uh, province, it, like province of Canada, it's a lot of people equate it to Texas, right? The Americans, Texas. Um, yeah, and, it's a big deal here. And, yeah. and, you know, it's, it's a pretty cutting edge uh, area to be in as well, because it, I know oil and gas gets a bit of a bad rap as far as the envir environmental side, but certainly um, the Alberta industry has worked really hard to try and improve its um you know, pollution output and that kind of thing. So 
it, there's a lot going on here. It's quite the place to be if you're in oil and gas. Hmm. Now you mentioned the R and D facility. Um, and I just, I just was wondering if you could talk to us about what, like, what is phytoremediation? It gets kind of technical. Uh, like you mentioned, you have field scientists that maybe go out to talk about, don't use this seed. This one's not working. Um, but would you, yeah. would you be able to talk to us about what phytoremediation is? Yeah. So when we, uh, implement these projects, we'll, have a client that's got um, a, con a contaminated soil. And generally in oil and gas, it's going to be crude oil or it's going to be salt. Uh, you release produced water when you're drilling for oil and gas and it's highly caustic and it, plants just don't grow in it. So they, you need to rem remediate it. In general, when you're looking at remediating contaminated soil, usually it's people dig it up and they take it to a landfill. When I first started I had no idea we were sending that much soil to the landfill. It's unbelievable, but it, probably, hey? It, it is unbelievable. Um, but there are other ways to deal with it. And so what we do is we'll come and we'll assess the, the site, assess the contamination, and say yes or no, it's suitable for having plants do this. And then we'll take the contaminated soil, we'll build a containment facility because you never want um, – the soil to like you know how heavy the rains are can mm -hmm. can be here in July. We get these massive thunderstorms that roll through that dump a lot of water. You never want to leach contaminants out of contaminated soil and have it go into the surrounding area. So when we have the soil, we build a containment facility, and it's usually a compacted clay liner that's burned and has a water collection sump in it, that sort of thing. And we'll lay out all the contaminated soil on it, and we'll make it flat. And then basically, we are farmers. So we'll um, prepare that as a seed bed and then we'll seed it. But the seed we're using has been coated with a specific type of bacteria that, we're, that we work with. And then as that seed germinates, the bacteria will colonize the roots. And the bacteria do two things. It provides a hormone that stimulates the plants to grow. And it also provides a compound that inhibits the stress ethylene that plants produce. So when the plants are unhappy, they'll produce an ethylene and that'll stop them from growing and then they look really ill. If you can block that, then the plants will continue to grow even though they're in challenging conditions. So the combination of providing a hormone and blocking the stress ethylene, it'll allow these plants to grow in really challenging conditions. And we're always dealing with contaminated subsoil. It's not like it's the topsoil in your garden and you're trying to grow stuff in it. It's all that stuff underneath that just isn't great, has no organics, that kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. not great to grow in. And so you, the bacteria can really push these plants to grow. And the plants themselves have these amazing capabilities. So when we're looking at salts or trace metals in the soil, you pick species that hyperaccumulate, which means that they will take those compounds out of the soil and accumulate them in their above ground uh, biomass. So they're, they're blades of grass. We mostly use agronomic grasses. And then when you harvest those grasses, you remove the contamination because it's now removed from the soil into the plant. When you're working with hydrocarbons, the bacteria will actually use the hydrocarbon as a food source. So it'll break it down into non-toxic components. And the plant in that case will provide this big rooting system that the bacteria oh, yeah. like to colonize like a highway so the plants like provide the home the highway yeah. for the bacteria to try okay gotcha yeah yeah so with hydrocarbons it's the bacteria that break it down with salts and trace metals it's the plant that takes it up but the bacteria allow the plant to grow when it, it is really challenged so it's a great uh great relationship and then you know we'll farm it and It'll, it takes some time. I mean, that's one of the things that people have a little bit of a problem buying into federal mediation is it does take some time. So you have to grow a couple growing seasons depending on how contaminated the soil is and it'll break down and, and then you can reuse it on the site. So it, 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 it's a great way to do it because it conserves the soil. And, and I don't think people realize how valuable soil is. So people look at it and they think, oh, it's just dirt. But it's this whole community of microbes and insects and other little critters. There's a seed bank in there of native species. There's organic. So, you know, it's this whole ecosystem that you want to conserve. And then if you're not trucking it to a landfill, you're saving all that carbon output that mm. comes with trucking long, long distances. And then, of course, 
it's really hard to build new landfills. So there's a limited landfill capacity. And if you're filling it up with contaminated soil that could otherwise be treated and kept out of landfills, uh, then you're just, you're going to run into a problem. So hmm. it's a, uh, it's, it's a really great system. And it, the one advantage to it, of course, is that it eliminates the liability instead of just transferring it from one place to another by putting it in the landfill. Yeah, exactly. There's a problem here. Let's move it there. It's still the problem. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. And so, what happens with the... Go ahead, Chris. What happens with the grasses? <laughs> well, yeah. Like, are they contaminated then? <laughs> no, because the plant is not going to take up... Uh, like, it's a natural hyperaccumulator. So it knows how to handle that much salt or trace metal, and it's never going to take up more than it can survive with. So it's not going to kill itself by taking up more salt than it's able to survive. And that's one of the reasons why it takes uh, quite a while when you're remediating salts and metals by using plants, because the plants have a limit to what they'll take, and it's, they're not going to hurt themselves. But um, generally, the clients are the ones that determine what happens with that material. and. Uh, the one thing that's all that clients have always been concerned about is that you don't want um, they don't want farmers putting their prized bull to go graze on grass that's growing on a site like that because if something were to happen to that bull that's completely unrelated to uh, what it's eating, it's still going to always have that question mark. Well, is was there something wrong with that grass, mm -hmm. right? And the toxicology studies have been done. The grass is perfectly fine because it's not going to take up anything that's going to harm it. And uh, yeah, in fact, when we're working on remote sites um, in forested areas, usually the critters graze the grass and then they wander off and poop elsewhere and that helps us get the salt off the site the deer and the moose and everything right oh, yeah. the grazers. oh we, yeah we had a site up in the northwest territories and the muskox grazed that thing like crazy oh, i love muskox they're so cool yeah there's yeah. i've never seen one in the wild though you have to go like way far away to see them things so yeah yeah those sites were up in the northwest Territories, so that's pretty far cool. far north now I have a, mm, this is, I have a thing, a question. Um, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a question I know the answer to sort of, <laughs> but it's a, it's a cool thing. You said, is it a question that I'm going to know the answer to? <laughs> you, I, I think you do because, all right. You mentioned that salt, like there's salt that comes, yeah. that contaminates. Now, is that the salt that comes out from the drilling process that's already under the ground? Yes. So uh, we had talked about that the last time and yes, it's a uh, historic salt water that's been trapped. Right. So what might make people like what might blow people's minds is in Alberta, when you drill for oil um, or natural gas, sometimes you hit, like you said, historic salt, which is ancient. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically ancient seawater from, was it the bear posse that covered most of Alberta and Saskatchewan? Um, I forget. Yeah, the, yeah. I don't, I'm not. Yeah, I don't, I can't tell you that one. <laughs> okay, but it's ancient salt water, basically. It's historic yeah. salt. Yeah. yeah. And I know when I started in this field, I'm like, there's salty water that you release when you drill into the earth? I never knew that. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. And it's really salty. Like, it's not go to the Atlantic Ocean and accidentally swallow some salt water. No. This stuff is highly, highly concentrated and kills everything growing uh, as soon as it uh, it's plants start to encounter it. Like it's, it's, sat, it's really it, toxic. It's saturated. Like it's absolutely saturated. Yeah. When we, like I worked in, yeah. what's the irony was I was on a space last night and I talked about how I worked in the oil patch for a bit. Um, and we had some salt water blurp out wherever we were drilling. Right. And it just instantly yeah. crystallized on your clothing. Like it just turned. Yeah. Out. So anyways, I just thought that was cool. You mentioned that and it might be, wild for people to hear that that don't don't necessarily yeah. know okay anyway sorry i'm off topic but it, i find that so cool that it's just ancient salt water <laughs> yeah yeah it is cool um so if you're just joining us we're talking with dr liz murray who's a senior scientist uh working with phytoremediation research and development in calgary alberta um i have a couple more questions before we open the floor to our audience i do see um I do see somebody waiting to speak, uh, but we're going to just finish our interview first and then we'll open up the floor to questions. And sure. yeah. So one of my last questions is you worked on a lot of different remediation projects. 
where contamin- contaminated soil has been quote unquote fixed, like made better, healed. Um, is, yeah. is there, is there a project that comes to mind that you could tell us about? Yeah. So we worked up in the Northwest territories. There was a site outside Norman Wells and it had a site, it was a site that had been abandoned and had a bunch of waste on it, contaminated soil. It contained both salt contamination and hydrocarbon contamination. And in order to do the traditional dig and dump on this site, they would have had to freeze in a winter road and then landfill it to Norman Wells. And I think the cost for that particular site was going to be something like three or four million dollars. Small oil and gas company, three or four million dollars to clean up one site. Hmm. It's just not going to happen. They just you just can't they can't afford to spend that kind of money. And as a result, these sites sit there for years and years and years uh, with contamination. So we came in at the University of Waterloo uh, started this project and then we came in to finish it. And uh, yeah, it uh, it was a prime example of what everything good about this technology. I know when we talk about the site and we show pictures of it, people say, well, you're way up in the, you know, the Arctic, you're pretty far up north. How do the plants grow? And it's like, well, for the short and growing season, what you lack in number of days, you gain in that 24 hours of sunlight and the (laughs) plants grow amazing. And then, of course, it takes um, fairly minimal equipment to be planting seed and growing on that site. Uh, They had uh, when the original winter road was put in they decided to leave a dozer and uh, a little shelter facility there so we had one piece of heavy equipment there which is basically all we needed and then some of the other work was done by hand but it was a great way you could fly in in the summer and do what you needed and do the soil assessment and and get that site cleaned up and it allowed the soil to stay in place you didn't have to truck it to norman wells it was a reasonable cost that the oil and gas producer could afford and it was a great demonstration of how that technology could be used to treat both salt contaminated contaminated and hydrocarbon contaminated soil. And uh, yeah, it was just a really great example. I talk about that site all the time. I love that. I love the point that you make that, um, yeah, it's way north, but when summer rolls around, it, the, it you have literally... 24 hours of light like it's just outrageous. And it's incredible when i was first in alberta i was actually born in the yukon so when i was first in alberta after grad school or, uh, i went up to the yukon to have a look and purposely went up at the end of june when it was 24 hours of daylight and it's amazing you can tee off for golf at midnight <laughs> i love it <laughs> yeah um so you were born in the yukon um yeah do you have memories from being a child up there because that like you'd be so far north in the in the in the winter the northern lights would sparkle across the night sky yeah so i was an army brat my dad was a civil engineer working on the alaska highway okay so we were only up there for a couple of years while he was posted up there so i actually grew up in thunder bay which is right on lake superior mm-hmm. um another amazing place to be uh the 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 outdoors there for recreational activities. Amazing. Of course, being on the lake, I mean, Lake Superior is so big. It's like being on the ocean. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was just, yeah. Cu- I was just curious. I had, um, uh, last year, a student of mine, uh, she lived in Northwest territories. Um, and that's what she said. Like her and her family would just go out and watch the Northern lights. Yeah, like I it, bet. it was like a TV show because they would just yeah. go across the lip and we get them where yeah. I've, sh- I've shared pictures on our social media. We get them in all, red deer, but nothing like way, way North. Um, yeah. Yeah. Again, off topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last question I have for you, because uh, we're, t- because this is a, a pet slash science account. Could you share a pet story from your life with us? Hello, everybody. The Science Podcast will always be free to download and listen to. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But we have some amazing ways that you can help us out with running the show. The first one is to think about becoming a patron on Patreon. And we call our patrons now the Paw Pack. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of awesome perks and different tiers of support. We also have a very detailed and excellent merch store. And if you're listening to this in time... We have pre-orders of the Bunsen 2.0 stuffy that was just adorable. Um, You can check it out. There's also the Beaker stuffy on our store and a whole bunch of comfy clothes. The third thing you can do is give us a good rating. Rate the podcast wherever you're listening to this. 
We'd love to get a great rating from you. Okay, back to the show. Sure. Actually, I'm going to share three quick ones. So, uh, you know, but I don't know how many of the listeners know, uh, I actually had a Bernese Mountain Dog Mm. back in 1998. I, I got him, Thor the Bernese. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I, my favorite story about Thor is that he was the perfect dog. <laughs> he only ever did, he lived to 14, which is uh, wow, quite old yeah. for Bernese. Yeah. Uh, he only ever did two bad things. The first is that uh, my husband had some pizza wrapped up in a saran wrap st- uh, on the floor by the front door before he was heading out to work. And he went to leave and he couldn't find it. And it wasn't until the saran wrap got pooped out the next day that we realized <laughs> where it went. And the only other thing he did that but that was bad is he took my visa bill and he chewed it up. So he's trying to I tell you something. He's trying to tell you something. <laughs> I guess, but yeah, he was the perfect dog. What a lovely dog he was. Yeah. Uh, and then I had uh, quite a rare breed, which I suspect most of your listeners probably haven't heard of, and that's Tibetan Mastiff, and that's a traditional guardian flock guardian breed out of Tibet. And they're quite a challenging breed to have because they are bred to be independent thinkers as because the people in Tibet uh, would release these dogs at night to guard the flocks and they would just run around the perimeter and guard mostly through barking because if you could scare away a predator, then you didn't have to fight them. But they were bred to take down snow leopards and other large prey. So they're quite an independent, fierce breed. and. And uh, so when I first got uh, a Tibetan Mastiff, I got um, I got Taku, who I'll, I'll tell a story about shortly. But I also took in a rescue named Moby, and he came a few years later. And and uh, it, it's a real challenge to bond with these dogs. And when we got Moby, he was uh, nine months old and was an emergency rehome. He'd been adopted by um, – he was born in California, had been adopted in Portland – to a family that really didn't understand the breed and had a small child that was teasing him and he started to lash out at the child. And so he went from his breeder to his owner, to a rescue person, to me up in Canada, um, all in a space of about eight weeks. And, and these dogs uh, really bond at six months of age. And, and when they bond, it's really hard to get them to bond to somebody else. And so when I got him, it took probably about three months to work with him to get him to realize that it was okay. He was going to stay here and he was going to be able to bond with us and not be abandoned. And uh, it was literally a light switch. One day he walked in and he was so sad. And I thought, you know, maybe this was a big mistake. I He's not happy here. I don't know what to do. He needs to be somewhere without children. He needs to be with other big dogs. I check all the boxes. And I thought, oh, what do I do? And then one day, the next day he walked in and it was like the light switch went on and he just looked at me and he's like, oh, I get it now. You're my human. Uh-huh. And uh, complete, I know. And the other funny thing with him is he was a California dog. So he was uh, over a year old. He was born on the September 11th and actually came to us with the name of Captain America um, with all the events that had happened on September 11th in, wow. this, in the U.S. back then. Anyways, uh, we had changed his name and he had uh, grown up in warm climates. And so when he had his first snow, he was so funny. Like I, th- there are a few really amazing things in life. And one of them is to watch a dog encounter snow it, the first yes. ever time. And yes. when, it happens as, when it happens as an adult, <laughs> even more special (laughs) and he he just thought that was the best thing ever and then his feet got cold and he just the 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 sad look on his face and i'm like okay i got it and i went and made him a set of booties and he was (laughs) looking at me you know like what's with the booty things like why would you put those on my feet and then he went outside and again the light switch went on he's like I know what these booties are for. And yeah, it was the, he just loved it. It took him about a year for his feet to get used to the snow and then he was fine. Yeah. But uh, Taku, my, uh, my female Tibetan Mastiff, that dog boy, she was, she was a smart, smart dog. She really took a lot of work to bond with. It took about a year and a half. I got her as a puppy out of um, the U S and it took about a year and a half to really uh, form a bond with her because if you're not motivated by food, toys, or praise, how do you get this dog <laughs> to learn manners and do what you ask? And with Tibetan Mastiffs, you have to do that by 
forming a bond with them and um it doesn't work any other way. And we, uh, we, she never would come when I called her, but we had this agreement that if I needed her to, to come to me, I would tell her to come and she would just sit where she was and I would go to her. So <laughs> <laughs> that was the agreement we had throughout her whole life. But she was a funny dog. She had a sweet tooth. And uh, I had tweeted this out um, earlier, but she was a funny, funny dog. She, I don't know if everybody in your audience would uh, remember the Life Savers storybook, but it's basically a cardboard box that's the shape of a book and you open it up and the sides are filled with rolls of Life Savers. Oh, Chris, well, knows, she, Chris knows about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she thought those were the best thing. My mom had sent me a Life Savers storybook for Christmas and I just had left it under the Christmas tree, not thinking that she would take it because, you know, who wants Life Savers? Well, I came home one day and she had stolen it and she used to take everything she stole up on my bed. And uh, my husband and I walk in the bedroom because she never came down to the front door. I'm like, okay, she's obviously got something up there. And we went up and she had unrolled every roll of lifesavers. And the <laughs> one that she liked, she ate. And the ones that she didn't like, she'd lick them and spit them out. What? And I bet you I had a hundred lifesavers fused to the duvet on my bed oh. and I, I, we just, like how do you get mad at that you're just killing yourself laughing and then you spend the next 15 minutes peeling lifesavers off the duvet wow. so you could try and wash the food coloring out of it oh it was so funny i know what flavor they were probably the the lime ones because they're, they're, uh, they're yeah you garbage. know i think i uh, know it's the mint she didn't like but oh, anything mint, that okay. was like butterscotch or oh, cherry oh, or anything yeah, so it's really funny Butterscotch. Yeah, the butterscotch she, one, they're so good. <laughs> yeah. She was a funny, funny dog. She is a good dog, too. <laughs> All right. If you're joining us, we have Dr. Liz Murray, and I think we'll open up the floor to questions from our audience. So um, you can probably answer most of the questions related to um, working with contaminated sites. Um, I, I think probably you'd, you'd, be able to answer many questions about the uh the bleeding disorder you worked with and and maybe things yep. about genetics um if that's the one thing the one thing i learn in science is if i don't know the answer i just say i don't know the answer <laughs> yeah that's that's the smart thing to do <laughs> yeah um i think we have on andrew john um has a question i see db ral lopez um you have a locked account. Could you DM me what your question is going to be? Um, so Andrew is up. And if you have a question uh, for our guests, go ahead and re request the mic. Um, Andrew. Okay. Andrew, go ahead. Hello. Hey, hi. Yeah, hi. I, came in, I, I came in when Dr. Liz was talking about the salt water. And I'm calling in from Ohio where we are dealing with... Um, radioactive brine from fracking uh, here uh, that is being used on the roadways for de-icing. Oh, wow. Oh, and why, why are they allowed to use radioactive brine to go on roads? They need to get rid of the brine, I guess. <laughs> but and, doesn't the radioactivity make it not suitable? Yeah, or, you would think so. Yeah, I would it think may, so. <laughs> Maybe I live in a state that doesn't appreciate science, I believe. But I... Oh, you're losing. Oh, I think... We've lost you. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm... Try, try again one more time. So we're trying to work with the State Department of Transportation on developing, developing some regulations for this radioactive brine they are at the point industrially <clears throat> where they might offer it for retail use to homeowners. Really? Yes. Who would put Why it? Why is that allowed? I know. I know. I know. Wow. And, <laughs> and so uh, we have 88 counties in the state, and we have one county that has a very strong environmental grassroots uh organization and they have gotten their own geiger counter um they they've asked the state for um 
to disclose the locations of where the brine is being distributed. And they're in the process of raising these issues. We're doing some research um, where we find that um, the the brine, if somebody walks in it, they can, you're out walking your dog, you can actually track radioactivity into your home. Mm-hmm. Well, what about when they lick their paws? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very that's a uh, very frustrating, Andrew. Um, I'm sorry to hear about that. Yeah. yeah so, so one county was able to get a waiver through the state Department of Transportation by presenting all these issues to them, and the, the state, you know, said, "Okay, we won't spread the radioactive brine in your county." Okay, so. Now we only have 87 counties to go. Oh, God. <laughs> wow. So, like, so. in Alberta, we encounter radioactivity occasionally on these gas sites, oil and gas sites, but that's that's a whole special disposal process, and they're very, uh, very uh, controlled about that. That's something that you just do not let off the yeah, site you're, unless you're not, it's in the proper disposal. You're not putting disposal. that down on Highway 2, right, Doc? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think one of the one of the things for this group is um, when you're working through you know a social political process, um, the group that I'm referring to doesn't really. There are a bunch of environmentally uh, focused <clears throat> citizens, but there's not a lot of science support. You know, so there's not yeah. a lot of scientists in the group. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes difficult um, to develop that perspective of uh, of asking the state, well, scientifically, you know, how do you know this is safe and ask the right questions? So that's just what I wanted to throw out. Thanks. Yeah, that's shocking. I've actually I would never have thought that was happening. So that's a that's a huge surprise to me. Well, Andrew, thank you for talking to us about that. Uh, hey, uh, just a follow-up question, Doc. In Alberta, those gas sites that have radioactive um, water slash brine, is that from like isotopes in the like the crust of the earth that is that has turned the brine radioactive? Is yeah, that- it's naturally occurring. Naturally occurring, right. So like, yeah, yeah, gotcha. yeah we call them norms. Okay. So naturally occurring radioactive material. Yeah, and there's a, there's um. It's it's not well. Having worked in nuclear substances and radioactivity, has often used as tracers for the various bioassays that we do for looking at protein function, that kind of thing. Mm. I I know a lot about radioactivity, although I haven't worked in it for a number of years. Um, but the there there is some regulations in Alberta around how to handle that particular material when you encounter it, and there are certain landfills that will accept that material, but it, it's radioactive right i mean it takes a long time to decay and it's uh yeah you just have to dispose of it properly Mm -hmm. it was a long time ago that i worked in the oil patch and um uh i remember they were testing the uh, what is it called the the structural integrity of of pipe down hole because it was an older site and they were using um they were definitely using something radioactive to test it, like yeah. x-rays. And we weren't anywhere near it. Like they made everybody yeah. work um, really, really far away. And um, I don't think it was radio. It was probably x-rays they were using, actually, now that I think of it. Um, I just, uh, no, there is a, there's a particular, I forget. Was it a paint? When I, did I, thought my I, ra- the, I thought I remember them, them painting it. I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. W- I, when I was doing my... Um, radiation safety officer training we had pipeline integrity people in that course Mm -hmm. and it's a specific uh ice to which i can't remember the life of me what it was but yeah uh that stuff you do not want to be around yeah yeah they sent us way far away and the people working on it had like 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 really serious suits on i see yeah yeah anyways yeah Hmm. yeah yeah Um, doctor doctor liz this is how this radioactive brine group started was from a pipeline integrity group because we had 
a gas pipeline coming across 12 of the 88 counties in our state. And this particular county um, did a, a number of things to try to block uh, the gas pipeline um, from coming through their county. So that's sort of where the group started. You yeah. know? And they were documenting like leakages and proximity to homes of certain link leakages. And so that's how the, and, and so the radioactive brine group sort of grew out from that. Yeah. Yeah. That, I'm still shocked that that's happening. That's, I, I do appreciate your perspective though, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll go to Karen J. Uh, Chris, could you bring Karen up? Karen follows us. Um, and I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know about um, the locked account. DB Ral Lopez. Um, could you DM me what your question is? We don't normally bring locked accounts up. Not that you're not trustworthy. Not that I don't want to hear what you have to say, but I'd like to just do some more due diligence. Go ahead, Karen. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, I'm in Maine. I, I don't know if you uh, can do anything about chemicals. We're now having an issue. Several of our farms were really good sports. They were encouraged to take this material to supplement their soil. And now, of course, they're finding these PFAS, PFAS. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so PFAS is a really uh, exploding area of environmental science. It's not something that we've worked in as of yet. It's something we're looking at doing some work on. It is, from what I remember, uh, you can clean it up with phytoremediation, but I'll have to go take a look at that. It's something, you know, we do a lot of environmental conferences, industry conferences, and PFAS has exploded in the last couple of years um, uh, in the area. So it's something that's new to me. I, I like I said, I don't know a lot about it, but it should be um, remediated. It should be able to be remediated by plants, and it's something we're going to look at in the future. That's really good because these poor farmers, you know, these are young families who put everything into their farm, and they don't yeah. want to walk away. But Yeah, on, for sure. On some levels, it looks hopeless. It's all the way down to the water table, and they're just, um, fortunately, we just passed well the legislature just passed um a bill that will put several million dollars into assisting these families and trying to work on the soil and but i i didn't know if it was possible to even fix yeah. it or if they just have to go somewhere else no um there there's technologies out there that are being used in pfas and um british columbia up here in canada uh, their conferences have a fair amount on PFOS. Um, if you send me a direct message, there, I, I can look into it a bit and uh, get back to you on that with some ideas. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And PFOS are these fluorinated compounds um, that I, I think we talked to, Chris, didn't we talk to, oh, uh, not Ra was it Rachel Humphrey? We talked to somebody about PFOS on Spaces. I think they came from a military base. Yeah, I think they're, I don't quote me 100% on this, but I think they're quite widely associated with uh, chemicals that are used in firefighting. And a lot of the military bases yeah. Yeah. have that, uh, would have had those in airports, that kind of thing. It's it's like the man in Ohio. It's, it's another situation of the, the government saying, um, this looks like a terrible thing. Let's see how we can spin it oh, no. and find a use for it. So it won't, you know, be so, yeah. so much of a strike against us. And it's just infuriating. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Well, Thank you. I'm, I am, I am hopeful that, uh, folks like Dr. Liz, uh, are, are on the job trying to clean up the clean up stuff. If the PFAS can be scooped up by plants. Hey, um, that's good. Yeah. That's good news. I think, yeah, yes. As far as far as I know, like I said, we personally haven't done work on it yet, but that is plan to look at that in the future. And there is a lot of work being done on PFAS, so there are solutions coming forward in that field. Cool. Okay. 
Okay, I did talk to um, DB Ral Lopez by DM. DB Ral Lopez, um, what was your question for Dr. Liz? You're a speaker, you can talk. Might just take a second. Yeah, it took me a bit to figure Hello. out how to give Twitter permission. <laughs> Hello, you you can ask a question now. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep, hello. Okay, I can't can't hear anything right now, so I don't know what is happening with the audio here. If you can't hear me, I just want to say this is very interesting. Thank you to Dr. Liz and to Bunsen for putting this together. I wish my niece would have been able to hear all of this, who is getting another degree from uh, Cal State Dominguez in Carson, California, and works in the lab doing the COVID. And just wants to continue her education. So this is something definitely different and very interesting. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Well, we could hear hear that even though you can't hear us. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so are there any other questions from folks in the audience that would would like to ask a question of um, Dr. Liz? I'm going to tell another okay, dog story. No What's that? Sorry. Can I, can I tell another dog story? Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so Taku, uh, Taku, was, she was a funny dog. Like I said, I, I just remember her when she was a six month old, she had a baby tooth that didn't come out. So she had to undergo an aesthetic to have that tooth pulled. And while she was having that done, we said, we'll go ahead and spay her. Um, even though she's a touch young. And so they did that. And so here's this, you know, big dog with this big cone on her head. And she thought it would be the funniest thing to chase after my old cat and run up the stairs behind the cat, scoop it up in her big cone and pin it against the wall in the bedroom. And she did that when I was getting ready for work one morning and I I could hear the commotion and I'm running upstairs only to find my dog with this giant cone pressed up against the wall and my poor old cat encircling her head inside the cone and I have to give that cat credit she was just chill about the whole thing because I had visions of my six-month-old puppy losing both her eyes but yeah it was it was so funny I mean those are things that you see in cartoons that you don't think happen in real life but yeah that was I don't know what possesses a dog to think it would be fun to pick up a cat in their cone of shame (laughs) um (laughs) uh Beaker and Bunsen, when they had cones in the winter, they would scoop the snow up and fling it. They thought that was oh, hilarious. Yeah. They thought that was well. Taku was smart enough. Uh, she had some issues with her thyroid when she got older, and and she had skin problems, and she was um, a real obsessive about that. So she would just chew. So mm. had to put a cone on her. That dog was smart enough to know when the, it was winter time and it was cold out. She'd go outside long enough for that thing to freeze. And then she'd go and bang it on things to shatter it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's how smart she was in the cone off her head. <laughs> um, one interesting thing, Doc, I did a, I broke down a study. They did a study on the Tibetan masses and they looked at the oxygen content in their blood. Um, and they can, uh, the Tibetan mastiff of all dog breeds have the, I think it's called the VO2 max. They have the highest VO2 max of any dog breed. Uh, I'm not surprised. And it's because they were bred in the high altitudes to, like be yeah. t- tireless as uh, guardian dogs. Yeah, because they patrol all night long. And those dogs, I mean, they're, uh, they're, everybody thinks of mastiffs as these big, massive, lumbering dogs, but these particular mastiffs, they had to be very agile. So they're these lean athletic bodies that are quite big and they have these huge manes around their neck and these huge fuzzy butts so that when they were fighting predators, if the predators went through their for their throat or tried to grab their rear end, they'd get mouthfuls of fur yeah. and, uh, and not get injured. And they also had, um, uh, like Taku is a t- traditional black and tan. So she had a black face with these tan eyebrows and they, the rumor is, or the, the history is, is that they developed these uh, different colored eyebrows so that when they were sleeping, they'd appear to be watching. Oh my so, goodness. Yeah. Quite the, quite a fascinating breed and they're very uh, feral very old they only have puppies once a year most dogs have two two litters of puppies but they would only um be able to be bred once a year so fascinating breed but 
really challenging to have uh, as a family dog. Mm. Uh, it's gotten better now that there's been years and years of domestication in the U.S. and Canada and Europe. But, uh, yeah, you really have to know what you're doing to take on a Tibetan Mastiff. I, I love that fact about the Maine. We talked about, um, that was a question on our pet chat last Saturday about Bunsen's, um, the Bernice mountain dog has that mane as well. Like they've got that yeah. fuzz around their neck. And again, so the stories go of the history. Well, Bernice mountain dogs aren't guardian dogs. They're like, they did patrol. They were farm dogs in the Alps. Yeah. Um, and they used that to help protect their family um, from predators. So they go to bite a Bernice mountain dog and they would just get fur. And yeah. that's what we saw with when Beaker was a puppy, she would just hang off of Bunsen's mane and he, <laughs> he would just walk around with a little leech on him. <laughs> yeah. I was lucky enough uh, several years ago uh, to run into a lady here in Calgary at one of the craft markets that specialized in spinning dog hair for knitting and other types of um, needle arts. And so I had her uh, spin a bunch of Thor's hair and then uh, the puppy coat from Moby and, and some hair from Taku because the Tibetan Mastiff, she heard of them but never actually touched uh, Tibetan Mastiff hair. And I said, well, I can fix that for you. I have two Tibetan Mastiffs. <laughs> and uh, they, they, um, have the, they have a different kind of hair that doesn't have an odor. So they were perfect for knitting and like knitting sweaters and incredibly soft. The undercoats were incredibly soft. So I am lucky I don't have my dogs anymore. They, they've passed on now, but I have a, a handmade sweater upstairs that I did. And the trim is all in Thor's hair. And then the body of the sweater is all in Taku and Moby's hair. So oh. every time I need a dog hug, I go hug that sweater. Oh, my heart. That's so precious. Yeah. It, oh, I love that. it was, uh, it's funny. Most people think, wow, what a great thing to have. And then some people think, ew. No. <laughs> you know, you, yeah, it's funny. Some people just thought that was the weirdest thing. And I'm like, wow. but, but. I can ju- I remember when I just rubbed my hands over this sweater, it just brings back all those memories of cuddling with those dogs and, you know, and all the dust bunnies I ended up vacuuming every day. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's the difference? We wear clothes made of sheep's stuff. Like, why not? Tibet- yeah, I know. I just thought, I thought, that, like, it's the same I thought that was a funny, uh, yeah, I thought that was a funny reaction. But I can tell you, and I've knit a lot of sweaters over my years, that sweater I've never worn because it's, just too hot (laughs) the insulation capacity of that fur is incredible and i've never been able to wear it it's just too hot (laughs) it's too hot i love it yeah Yeah. bernice mountain dog and tibetan mastiffs they they are bred for the cold that's for sure (laughs) yeah they are um do you have time for one more question uh doc okay so hi, hi paula how's it going I'm doing good. Thanks. Um, Hi, Dr. Liz. Thank you for coming tonight. This is so fascinating. And yes, I've heard of knitting dog sweaters. I'm a knitter and I uh, had a client that had Bernice mountain dogs and she had yarn. Oh, wow. her bird, so it's, it's, it's cool. And I, and I can totally relate, but anyway, yeah. and I'm, and I'm, I'm envious of your cycling cause I'm a cyclist and having bike paths, but well, I'm digressing here, but that's so cool too. I wish we had more <laughs> of those around here, but yeah. my question is on the insulin this plant-based insulin. I think that's fascinating. And I wish, uh, the pharmaceuticals would tune into what you guys are doing because it's so expensive in the States. Um, you know, either on a pet level or a human level. Um, I have a family member that is diabetic and the cost of insulin is through the roof. And you know, it's, it's funny because I don't understand why in the States, because when we were, I mean, one little known fact is here in Canada, you don't need a prescription to go get insulin. You can just walk into a pharmacy and get insulin and it cost about $20 a vial back when I was doing that. So it's probably more like $30 a vial now, but yeah, it's, it's very accessible in Canada, but in the States, it's incredibly expensive. It's, it's horrible. I mean, um, even dog insulin, cause we have two diabetic dogs and one's like $20, but the other one's $60 cause they both take two different kinds. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And my father-in-law takes insulin and he spends over $200 a month. And it's a problem in the States because it, the yeah. price is almost like price gouging. And it's like, yes. why would you, would it something that you were doing? Was it like a David versus Goliath thing with the pharmaceuticals or is, are they kind of like, you know, poo pooing that because they want to monopolize this market? kind of, it's kind of infuriating sometimes when you hear this and, but I, I'm fascinated by what you did and I applaud you because I think that's just amazing. And 
Thank yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating way to do it. I mean, with new, the thing with injectable, if you want to work in an incredibly hard field, injectable drugs is one of the hardest fields to work in in medical science because it's so easy to kill somebody when you're injecting things into them. So it's it's a it it requires a lot of expertise, but there's also a lot of safety measures in place. And when you introduce a new production platform like plants, because there wasn't insulin on the market that was made from plants, it's a foreign platform that a lot of people in a lot of pharmaceutical companies just don't have expertise with. And they don't want to be the first to go through the hurdles of bringing something that new to the market. So that was one of the hurdles we faced was uh, overcoming the challenges with a new uh, production platform that the big pharma weren't familiar with. Okay. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, like I said, I, uh, I applaud you. I think it's uh, fascinating um, the, the studying in the field that you're doing. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Paula. Uh, Andrew, I saw your hand up. Did you have a comment or question? Yeah. Um, the lady that was just speaking about the insulin, I lived in Vermont for a few years and my wife is diabetic. And in Vermont, being close to Canada, I don't know, but it was the same situation, Dr. Liz. You could walk into any retail pharmacy in the state and get insulin um, without a prescription. Well, my wife had a paper prescription in her purse that we carried, you know, that we could present, but there was no transaction. There was no money exchanged and it was for syringes also. Yeah. Yeah. And I found the expensive part with, uh, diabetes and insulin is the actual test strips for getting your blood glucose. Those were incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, Dr. Liz, we, um, we just transitioned over to a Medicare approved, um, sensing device, uh, using a smartphone. So every two weeks I install, um, a sensor on my wife's upper arm and she activates it with her smartphone and she can read her blood glucose level whenever she wants. Yeah, um, I saw uh, there's a lot of advertising for those up here in Canada. Yeah. It's fascinating technology and would make it so much easier than doing the the finger prick all the time. I have a student who has that actually. Um one of my students is uh severely diabetic and they they showed me on their phone. They have a little app on their phone that regulates it, which is kind of cool. Or not well, it just tells them what their blood glucose is. Yeah. And the right. thing about the thing about diabetes is it's not if you're going to get a complication like vision loss or or some other um, neuropathy or something like that, it's when. And the when is completely determined by how well you look after your glucose levels. So the better job you do at monitoring and controlling, the longer it's going to take for you to develop those complications. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, Chris, were you going to say something? Yeah, I just have uh, two students as well who uh, who use that uh, technology, and it just works really well for kids um, because, like, they're growing and changing, and it, it monitors their levels better than, um, and if they need to change their medication or make adjustments, then uh, they know probably sooner rather than later, and then they don't have to prep themselves. So that's always a win. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we'll, we're at the end. There's no more speakers and we're a little past the hour point. Um, Dr. Liz, thanks so much for being our guest tonight on Spaces Unleashed Science Chat. Thanks for having me. This and, was so uh, good. This was so good. It's always fun to talk about dogs and science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, do you, you're not, is your Twitter really that active? Are you on Twitter all the time? Like, can people follow you? Um, or is- uh, yeah, you can follow me. I don't post all that often um but my direct messages are also open so if you have a question or a follow-up then send me a note and yeah but uh, i like to tweet about cycling (laughs) cycling football games which we didn't need to talk about but uh yeah i don't know if it just as uh, an aside if any of you are watching the nbc series about the rock dwayne johnson uh he 
is covering his part when he was trying out for pro football and the team that he tried out for is the Calgary Stampeders. That's the Canadian football uh, league team that's here in Calgary. So it's kind of funny to see this big American star with this TV show talking about the Calgary Stampeders. So. I love that story. Um, I've listened to, I've listened to a couple of his interviews talking about, um, cause he came from the NFL, right. And he came to Canada yeah. and the rules were different. And he's like, what the hell? Like he was so I confused. Know. And he, he didn't last very long. <laughs> well, you know, he's, he's made a, he probably for the best made a, a, a better, yeah. better career choice than the CFL. Yeah. The WWE <laughs> and yeah. the movies and the movies. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you betcha. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. We're going to close out the space. Uh, and thanks for telling everybody if they have some follow-up questions, they could DM you. That's awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks for coming to Spaces Unleashed Science Chat tonight with our guest, Dr. Liz Murray. Um, special thanks to my co-host extraordinaire, Chris and all of the speakers that came up to ask questions and all of you in the audience. Thanks for coming out to our science chat. The next space that we have is every Saturday at 6 PM. It's pet chat. You can come talk about your pets, share stories. Uh, Dr. Liz, you're welcome to come too. tell us more stories about the animals from your life too. Um, we, we have a game that we play and we have a sponsor. So somebody's going to win a prize. If you check out the science podcast, you can hear Dr. Liz Murray's full interview interview with me, I believe in season two. Um, so yeah, Dr. Liz Murray was on the science podcast. The new episode of the science podcast is out uh, and we have uh, Dr. Devin the Chemist. Dr. Devin the Chemist is our guest and uh, she'll wow you with her knowledge about mass spectroscopy, which is really cool. All right. Um, anything else to say, Chris, tonight? Uh, no, just thank you all for coming. And um, I just really enjoyed this space, uh, learning about phytoremediation and um, the fact that the plants don't take in enough of the, the toxin to uh, kill themselves. Uh, and I really appreciated that knowledge because I can share that with my students because they wonder about um, Chernobyl and the, the sunflowers and the thick wood. What are they going to be radioactive sunflowers? Uh, so now I have an answer for that. Hmm. They seem to be smarter than humans because I've definitely taken in too much turkey that I could potentially kill myself with. So there you go. You know, like at Thanksgiving. Anyways, thanks for coming, everybody, tonight. I hope to see you all on Saturday for Pet Chat, at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, for science, empathy, and cuteness. Space ending in three, two, one, zero. Bye, everybody.